Christianity is a religion founded on the belief of Jesus Christ. As the Savior, as God's Son, uh, as the promised Messiah. It's, we believe in, in God, Jehovah God or Yahweh God, uh, as revealed through Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus uh, was the incarnation of God, that he died on the cross and bled and rose again uh, to redeem us from our sins, to reconcile us to the Father. Um, and the love that God shows, he shows through Jesus Christ in a very unique and powerful way. And Christianity is a matter then of following Christ's example in the way that we live. Well, there are three major faith groups in the world. There's Judaism, there's um, Islam, and there's Christianity. Now, Christianity is a major faith of the world, but Christianity is one that experiences God through the Lordship and personhood of Jesus Christ. We believe Jesus was um, incarnated from God the Father, and we experience God through Christ and through His Spirit. Judaism, Christianity, and the Muslim faith are all monotheistic, mono meaning one. They believe in one God. But Christianity is different in that the one God is expressed in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And very importantly, the Son, Jesus Christ, is the salvific person that all people need to be in relationship with. I think the the biggest difference is we see Jesus as Christ, as God, as Son of God. Several different ways of, of understanding that. In Judaism, they saw Jesus as a prophet, a human prophet. And uh, even the Muslims also believe that Jesus was a prophet. Uh, just as Muhammad was a prophet. In Christianity, we believe it was far more than that, and that he was, in fact, God incarnate. So I guess in a nutshell, that would be Christianity. Methodism fits into the Christian uh, faith uh, as, a, as a Protestant denomination. Um, the Catholic Church, of course, the Great uh, Reformation in the 1500s and several Protestant churches spawned from that. Methodism came from the Church of England, which is a very, very old denomination. Uh, Samuel Wesley was a pastor, uh, a poet, uh, a writer, a fascinating man. His wife Susanna was a theologian, although she didn't carry that title, but she was a great theologian in her heart. They had a whole bunch of children, uh, and two of them were John and Charles Wesley, who were basically the founders of, of the Methodist movement. Uh, John was the theologian uh, and the um, entrepreneur, if you will. Uh, Charles was the poet and the songwriter. John Wesley, back in the 17, early 1700s, was an Anglican priest and had gone to church and had known Christianity all his life. His father was a minister. He became so frustrated, he was being taught the scriptures and being taught what Jesus asked the people that followed him to do and how to live their lives and looked all around him and did not see that happening. Saw people going to church on Sunday morning and checking that box and then going home and living their lives as if they weren't Christians and that none of this mattered. One of the things that John Wesley felt the church was lacking was its outreach to those in need. It tended to be a very cloistered for the well-to-do sort of uh, thing. And he felt that was not the calling of the church or what Christ was calling them to. And so they began this holy club. Uh, when they were at Oxford, when John went to Oxford, uh, he wanted to, he joined something called the Holy Club, which his brother Charles had actually started before him. And so uh, it was a club that studied scripture. And again, these are all part of the Anglican or the Church of England. They're uh, studying to be uh, pastors, studying to be priests in the Church of England. And so, you know, they had this club at Oxford at college. They would provide food for those who were in prison or those who were starving on the streets of London. They would go into the coal mines and bring instruction, what we would call school, 
Uh, they did that on Sunday and thus the beginning of Sunday school for those children to bring education to them so that they could live a better life. And they prayed together, they did works of kindness and charity together, they studied scripture together. A very thoughtful, intentional way of living your life, a life of holiness, both inner holiness, of praying and reading the Bible, and an outer holiness of actually getting out of your house or even outside of the walls of the church and visiting people in prison and reaching them and teaching them about Jesus Christ. Uh, the story goes that they were so methodical in their uh, religiosity, so methodical in their practice of their faith that they were nicknamed Methodist. 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 That's kind of the way it gets started. John never wanted to start a religion or faith structure. He was, uh, he really wanted to uh, revitalize the Church of England. He wanted to revitalize uh, a faith that had gotten kind of, kind of cold and distant and impersonal. Uh, so uh, this Methodist movement was one of uh, spirituality. It was one of a, a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It was an evangelical one. Uh, uh, again, it was very well received uh, in the United States uh, once it got really started and grew like wildfire in the United States. Although, again, he was from England and he lived in England most of his life. He came here, John Wesley came here for a brief period of time as a missionary. That did not go particularly well, but he went back to England and the Methodist movement began to grow in England and then he moved, uh, he sent uh, pastors and bishops and folks here to the United States and it began to grow very rapidly until in the um, mid to late 1700s it finally became a church. And uh, that's where the Methodist church thus began. It's a very broad subject getting into how the Christian church began to splinter and break off into different denominations after about a thousand years. but. For sure, the Methodist Church, again, um, stresses the idea of a living a life of holiness, a, a disciplined, purposeful life of living holiness out, um, and depending and celebrating and even marking the grace of God in the journey of life. We believe in a system of grace. We believe that there is something called prevenient grace which is the grace and love of God that calls us into faith, that calls us to God, prevenient as in coming before. So that prevenient grace from the time we're born, that prevenient grace of God is wooing us, like uh, C.S. Lewis called it, a hound of heaven, is wooing us to faith. When you discover God and realize your need for Him and accept Jesus Christ as the living Son of God and your Savior, you receive a justifying grace that cleanses you from the stain of sin and reconciles you, brings you back together in, a, in a, the relationship with God that God wants more than anything. And then once that is done, then we believe in what's called sanctified grace. We believe that salvation is more than just an event. Salvation is a process. In fact, Methodists from time to time have used the word going on to perfection, that once we are in that right relationship with God, the sanctifying grace of God comes into our hearts and lives and helps us to grow and to get closer and closer uh, to, uh, to God and helps us to become more who God wants us to be. Grace is the undeserved, unmerited love of God. It's the crazy idea that God loves us, both you and me, not because we've done something or earned it or deserve it for one reason or another. The only reason is because God chooses to. God wants to love us. We believe in the scripture as the inspired word of God. And in that sense, we look at it from the, from the standpoint that each one of the different writers for each one of the different books contained within that Bible were inspired by the Holy Spirit in the process of recording whatever stories, events, uh, activities that they recorded. But belief in God, belief in Jesus Christ, and belief in the Holy Spirit are the, are the real tenets upon which 
our our beliefs are are based. And uh, John Wesley himself once said that if you believe in God, you believe in Jesus, you believe in the Holy Spirit, take my hand. And he really wasn't concerned about a lot of the other little things. Now, there's other Protestant denominations that share 90 something percent probably of our beliefs in the Methodist Church, but some are different, like the Baptist Church will not baptize an infant as we do. The Baptist Church believes in a believer's baptism. They believe that a person needs to be old enough and aware enough to make the choice themselves to receive the sacrament of baptism. Whereas in the Methodist Church and the majority, honestly, of the Christian faith um, believe that while there are two halves of, of baptism, there's the person's choosing and willingness to become a member of God's family. The other half is the act and the work of God that God does to make that happen. And, and we in the Methodist Church hold that to be more important to, and uh, more weight. And so when a, pers a parent brings a small child to be baptized, we will not prevent them from becoming uh, members of the household of God. But one of the main differences in our church structure, Methodists are what we call a connectional church. Uh, we don't believe like we're in like competition with each other. Um, and personally, like I belong to the North Georgia Conference, and the North Georgia Conference sends me to Methodist churches. They send me to churches. Uh, and the United Methodist Church owns this church building, and, and rather than the individual congregations owning and calling their own pastors like they did in like a Southern Baptist church, we um, are more co connected through the um, larger structure, the Methodist church. Uh, also, we believe in salvation like the Baptists do, but we, Baptists will talk about it more in terms of an event. You know, when we say Methodists believe that's that salvation moment's the starting point of our salvation, not the only point, but the start, you know, that we had the prevenient grace that brought us to that moment. We get to that moment of justification or salvation, and then, as I said before, the sanctifying grace carries us on. So salvation isn't a one-time event. Salvation was a process started before we knew we were saved, and it continues after we've made that decision to follow Christ. Another Protestant denomination that may be different also is the Presbyterian Church. They are, um, their founder was John Calvin. Back when John Wesley was around, there became a division in the Christian church between Armenians, which John Wesley represented, and Calvinists, which John Calvin represented. Armenians, and that has a lot to do with Methodism, believe that, uh, that there was unlimited grace, that anybody could come to faith in Jesus Christ that there weren't just a few that, was, that were chosen to, be, uh, to live in faith, but that anyone could come to faith, that all were called uh, to come to faith in Jesus Christ. John Calvin uh, grabbed hold of an idea from many times in scripture, uh, Jesus speaks of, the, of people as being elect. And John Calvin wrestled with that quite a bit. He, I think John Calvin struggled with the idea that God could be completely sovereign and all-powerful and yet human beings could choose not to follow him or be his children. That somehow if a person had the free will to choose to not be a Christian, somehow that made God less powerful. And John Calvin loved and revered God and refused to believe that that was possible and so developed his doctrine that there were people who God simply did not want to be part of God's family. They were chosen. Some were chosen to be baptized and become Christians, and others they just weren't, because that would be the only way that John Calvin could reconcile that a all-powerful sovereign God could exist and still have simple human beings like us be able to say yes or no to being his father. Uh, Catholics believe in something called transubstantiation. So when the priest blesses the elements, the bread and the wine, 
Uh, the Catholics believe that that literally becomes the body and blood of Christ. It still tastes like bread, tastes like wine, but it's literally you're consuming the body and blood of Christ. We believe, Methodists believe, that it's just the Spirit of God that participates with the elements. And they're not really changed. They're, not, you know, uh, they're still bread and wine, but the Spirit of God participates uh, in that. We also don't have a Pope. We don't have someone who's infallible. We have uh, our system, the Methodist Church was developed or came to be about the same time the United States came to be. So we have the same sort of structure as the, as the United States does. We have a judicial, a legislative, and executive branch that all work together to, um, to order the church rather than a system of bishops and popes and so forth. There are some 40,000 Christian denominations in the world, and each one of us have a, a minute sort of thing that separates us from another one. But I think the, the feature of Methodism that we emphasize and, and I think is kind of our, our calling card of what it means to be in relationship with God is the emphasis on God's grace. We certainly understand judgment. We understand uh, our difficulties with sin and our need for being redeemed. Uh, and we hold all of those in common with the other religious uh, groups that you mentioned. But I think because our emphasis is more on the grace rather than on the condemnation and sin, um, it allows us to uh, help folks feel more hopeful and welcomed. Um, we certainly take sin seriously, but we also seriously know that it's been forgiven. Uh, faith itself, again, is a very broad term, of course. Faith is the belief in uh, and the loyalty to something. So uh, if uh, you're talking about uh, Christian faith, it's the belief that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the incarnation of God, that Jesus bled on the cross and died and rose again so that we might be uh, justified with God, we might be made right uh, with, with God. But it's more than just the understanding, the empirical knowledge that Jesus existed. It's also trusting in that and having loyalty to that and believing in that. Uh, more so than just that it existed, but that it's the right way to live your life, the right way to believe, and the right way to relate to God. Faith is a lot like hope. Hope is when you want and expect and yearn for the outcome of something in the future. Faith is having and living and having that certainty now in something. Faith is different from belief. Belief is, is kind of easy, actually. I believe that uh, the moon will come up tonight. And I actually probably have some faith in that, but it really doesn't determine how I live my life. If the moon doesn't come up tonight, I'll still be living in faith with God. So faith is that which really affects our life, guides our life. Uh, establishes that relationship with God. And so for that reason, it's, it's different than just belief. There are many times I've uh, have encountered people and shared uh, conversations with folks that we've gotten to know each other and discovered that in their lives they would uh, share with me that things had happened in their past that were sometimes very, very tragic, uh, harmful and painful, or sometimes very amazing and miraculous. And at that time when those things happened, they simply had no idea what was really going on. But later, uh, in the future, they would look back and felt that they could clearly see God's hand involved using those circumstances to shape them, to, to strengthen and grow their faith. Uh, we have what we call the Wesleyan quadrilateral, which is four sides of of uh, this un un understanding, and that is we believe in Scripture, that Scripture is prime, that we uh, get most of our understanding of faith 
most of our understanding of God and the world through, through Scripture. We believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God. It comes from experience, you know, uh, the, the experiential side. The Holy Spirit witnesses to my heart and life. I can, I can feel God inside of me. You know, I can feel the workings of the Holy Spirit. It's, exp it's uh, um, experiential. Uh, it's also um, reason. My head talks to me a lot about faith. I look around and I don't believe that this is just by happenstance. You know, I believe that there's a, a creator, or um, master, uh, des designer. And then the fourth leg of that, the fourth side of that is tradition. And by tradition, I don't mean something that we've always done. I mean the writings of the fathers of uh, you know, Augustine and, and Bart and all the fa fathers that came before uh, in faith who wrote and made observations. And so we read those and we go, yeah, that's cool. That's exactly right. You know. so, so yes, it's experiential, it's reason, it's reading, and, and it's, it's all that combined. And that's what informs our faith. The beginning of faith, or the beginning of the journey towards faith, usually comes from education. Uh, that's one of the reasons why education is so important in the Methodist Church. Uh, we spend a lot of time with Christian education and helping people to hear what the Bible has to say and uh, what Jesus taught, uh, what his life was like, the life that he calls us to. Uh, and that's all important because without that foundational information, it would be difficult to know what to believe in. But that's not really faith. For John Wesley himself, you would think somebody who was so devout, raised in the church, became a, a, a pastor in the Church of England and uh, was extremely educated uh, had his holy club that had met and done all of those praying times and studying times and, and all of those helpful times uh, for those in society. Uh, you know, doing all of those things, you would think that, you know, he had to be just absolutely steeped in faith. But he discovered that he really lacked faith. It's not that he didn't believe in Jesus or God or any of that, he did. But what he discovered was that he didn't have that life assuring faith that he saw in other people. And because of that, he struggled. He struggled a great deal, so much so that Finally, after having failed in Georgia with his mission trip to convert the Indians and, and then to be a pastor in Savannah and all that kind of blew up, he went home to England and was pretty depressed with the whole situation. He wasn't sure that he ever had had faith. And one evening, he went to a place in Aldersgate, a Moravian meeting that was taking place, and he heard talk about what it meant to have faith. And what happened was all of that knowledge and belief and, and study and everything else that he had acquired through his life that was all up here in his head finally made the most important move that it could make. It moved to his heart. He said, I finally realized that Jesus died for my sins. For my sins. Not for just the sins of the world, but for John Wesley's sins. And he said his heart was strangely warm. I guess strangely warm because he hadn't felt that kind of relationship with God. And now he knew. And that is faith. I think faith is important because our understanding, which is very limited of course, but our understanding of God in its most basic sense is relationship. We understand in the Christian faith God being the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in that, 
there is inherently a relationship. And that is exactly what God wants for human beings, for each one of us. God wants to have a relationship with us. And in a relationship, if you have a relationship with a person, you want to have a, if you're having a good relationship, you want to trust them. You want to believe that they trust you. You want to believe that they care about you, that they love you, and that they love you maybe even enough that if necessary, they'd be willing to sacrifice themselves for something for you and for your benefit. And so faith is, faith is trust, like I said, then I think having that relationship with God, having that trust in God is super, super important because that's the kind of relationship that God yearns to have for each one of us. Faith is what designs your life. It's what guides and interprets your life. That faith is what causes you to make the choices that lead you closer and alongside God and God's work in the world. That's why it's important. I think the point of faith is to relate to God uh, and also to relate to um, one another. I think that all of us are born within us a desire to belong. I believe all of us are also born with a great desire to worship, to have something outside of ourselves. And so my faith uh, helps me to relate to my brothers and sisters. I believe since God is my Heavenly Father that we all are children of God and therefore uh, everybody's my brother and my sister. So my faith teaches me that every, everyone is a brother and a sister to me. So I want to treat them that way regardless of what they look like, who they are, where they come from. So it's important to me uh, to the way I look at everybody else. It doesn't really matter the age that we're in. The question for every human being always is, who am I and what am I about? What am I supposed to be about? What matters? And we're always searching for that, have throughout, well, since Adam and Eve, <laughs> trying to figure out what it means to be a human being. And to be a human being is to be one created by God for a purpose. Well, I think it, they need faith, especially in modern times, you know, because I think we try to make, first of all, try to make sense uh, of, the, of the world and make sense of things. Uh, again, I think it's that desire that, that's more than a desire, it's an absolute need to reach out and touch something beyond ourselves. Uh, and we can become so isolated in the culture the way we have it today. And culture can be so, so mean sometimes we want to say, what, what's the reason for even being here? You know, why am I here? Do I have any existence? Does my existence mean anything? And faith tells us absolutely that God loves you so much that God would come to earth and be incarnate, empty himself of all his uh, celestial being how to be born of a, of a teenage girl named Mary in, a, in a, a manger in Bethlehem because God loves you God cares for you that much that's how important you are uh, and so that God would die for you so that should teach us that even in this huge world that we have in this complex and, and harsh world that, that we, we are loved by God and by others it's been an interesting experience with the pandemic because more and more churches have gone online. We now have uh, worship services uh, from our local churches that we no didn't have in the past. And, and we no longer have to worry about whether or not I get up in time to go to church because, oh yeah, well, I'll just go over and turn it on and I, I can watch. Um, it's a different experience. Um, during this COVID pandemic, a lot of us um, a lot of people in the church, especially the leaders and those who serve, have tried so hard to find ways to keep us connected. And technology has really helped in that sense where we're able now, as just as you're, I'm being videoed now, this could be broadcast on YouTube to the entire planet all over the world and be accessible. And that's amazing. That's uh, something that even just a hundred years ago is, wouldn't have been possible. Um, the danger, or maybe the, I think something that some of us 
are concerned about now is that we see people wanting to be a church digitally and not together actually with each other in the same room or in the same building. In my observation, it seems the better communication we have, the less we're able to communicate, you know. We have all these wonderful tools, um, iPhones and, you know, internet and email and all these wonderful tools. And you think we should be so incredibly connected, but we've all had the experience where we, you see somebody sit down in a, in a restaurant and rather than look at each other and talk to each other, they're all on their phones. They're looking at Facebook or texting or whatever it might happen to, to be. The other thing I think that's kind of tough is, um, or problematic is on our phones, on our emails, um, we don't look at the other person in the eye. So we're tempted to say things in a way that we might not say in person. And those statements hurt people, you know. We don't think about one another when we're sitting uh, at night on our computer or on our tablet. We don't think about sometimes what we're doing, how, what we're saying is going to affect other people who may have a different view uh, than we have. And so again, relationships are, are, are severed as, as well. For the church, it's the same thing. It's great opportunity, amazing opportunity. The pandemic, you know, taught us uh, that with, with technology. We, um, here at our church, Sam Joe's church, the first time we did something online, we had a fella just go on uh, Facebook Live, you know, with his phone, you know, and just held it up, you know. And that's how we had our first online experience, you know. Our first, and so, you know, we, people liked that, people appreciated that, and we realized when we started cutting down in-person worship and had to stop that for a while, we really felt important that people would, could worship together. And so we started, we added staff, we added people, you know, technology people, we've got, you know, we're, now we've got dozens of cameras all over the church, we've got a recording studio that we you know, edit things in, I mean, we're doing things, and the result of that has been pretty amazing. Uh, I've gotten a phone call, more than one, but one I particularly remember. A lady called me and she says, you don't know me, I live in Oregon. She says, somehow, she said, I don't even know, but somehow I found your worship service, you know, on YouTube. She said, and I've been watching you every week and worshiping with you, and I've got a problem. Would you pray with me, you know? On the other hand, we've got some folks who uh, said, uh, said, you know, I just kind of like having brunch uh, in the bed, watching the service on the, on the computer, you know. And so they've actually come less to church, you know, less to the, to the fellowship. So it's a very complex and, like I said, a paradoxical, it's a blessing and a curse, you know. We might be a little concerned that that might be replaced, having a real relationship and having a real community of people may be replaced with um, a very much like John Wesley was frustrated with a checking the box where people might just turn on a television on Sunday morning in their pajamas and eat some French toast and watch a video and call it done. It's getting to the point now where we don't feel comfortable uh, saying we want supporting the, the same causes. So um, some folks are very, very pro-life, some are very pro-choice. Um, and so, you know, just financially and uh, with human resources as well, some folks say, I don't really want to put my money in the offering plate and know that that money is going to support these causes. Especially nowadays, uh, there are a lot of, there, uh, in the last 50 years, uh, human sexuality has been a point of conflict and tension theologically and doctrinally in churches and many denominations, not Catholic quite so yet, but in many Protestant denominations, and there have been uh, church splits and splinters and things. The United Methodist Church is in the midst of that now and is wrestling with that and may find itself breaking apart into one or more halves um, to address that problem. You know, during the Civil War, there was a lot of dissension over a bishop who owned a slave. Again, kind of a complex story. A bishop owned a slave. Uh, where he lived, at, which was Georgia, it was against the law to free a slave. He wasn't going to sell the slave because if he sold the slave, the slave would be sold again, you know, into slavery. He wouldn't do that. He couldn't free the slave. Um, so he kept uh, this person as a friend, you know, and, but he did own a slave. And so the church 
you got the big fight over, over that. So all the, um, all the states where uh, slavery was legal uh, was separated from the rest of the church. So all the states where slavery was legal, uh, the, the Methodist churches in those states formed another denomination called the Methodist Episcopal Church South. Uh, as a matter of fact, this church, if you go out and you look on the cornerstone of this church, you'll see that Methodist Episcopal Church South. Because sadly, the church stayed divided like that, the Methodist Episcopal Church, the Methodist Episcopal Church South, until um, 1939. It wasn't until 1939 till everybody got back together again. Um, and so uh, they got back together again uh, and then lived happily in 1968, by the way. We brought in more people. Uh, from some from a, a German uh, expression of Methodist, and they came in, the United Brethren and the Evangelical Brethren came in, and that's what made the United Methodist Church. Right now, the United Methodist Church has, um, I think, 11 million uh, members. Uh, I think that number will greatly reduce, but there'll be other Methodist churches. The Methodist family is, is huge already. Uh, we've got, you know, we've got uh, um, Evangelical Methodists, we've got uh, uh, um, Congregational Methodist, Free Methodist, the Nazarene came out of the Methodist Church. Um, the, some of the Pentecostal denominations came out of the Methodist Church. Salvation Army came out of the Methodist Church, and they called them Salvationists. Uh, you know, the Goodwill, by the way, came out of the Methodist Church. It's not, it's not a, a, a church, but, but so we've, we've had so many splinters uh, in the past in our, in our church. Uh, but this one is a little bit bigger than, than most. Because I believe and because I think Methodists believe uh, that God's will will be done, no matter how splintered and how fractured we as uh, human beings in our relationships and in these institutional groups of denominations and religions might be, that the church is safe in, in God's hands and that when Jesus said, um, that his church would never be destroyed and never be undone. I have faith in that. I think the Methodist faith is fine. I think that as far as the Methodist church, I think it will continue to develop, evolve, change as it has throughout its history. Um, there may be divisions, there may be reunions. That's all part of our church history and that part I don't worry about. We're totally dependent upon God's grace. And if we have that faith, the rest will take care of itself. About seven, eight years ago, we, when we saw this split coming down the road, we formed an organization. I'm a charter member of the organization called the Wesleyan Covenant Association, which sought to bring more uh, some of the traditional um, groups uh, together. You know, we have a lot of different traditional groups. Uh, we brought them together so that we could, so we could advocate for them and also try to hold them together so there wouldn't be a, um, an unpleasant split. We try to be as, as uh, Christian, as kind, as loving as possible in splitting. Now, there's always hard feelings when you go through something like that. But um, that group, the Wesley Covenant Association, uh, is going to be like the, uh, the midwife to the global Methodist church. So once the global Methodist church is birthed, um, then the Wesley Covenant Association will disappear. As far as world views, well, we've always had to tussle with them. Um, the world certainly doesn't look at life the same way that we do. And, uh, and so we have to struggle with that, uh, both from the sense of struggling to sort out what makes sense and what doesn't, but also what we're going to choose to live by and what we're going to choose not to live by. But as far as all the division, all the different ideas, when it comes down to our belief and our faith in God, that becomes the uniting factor. Um, is it easy? No. And, you know, there's so many opportunities for us to go astray. 
that certainly is a very, very uh, easy thing to do. But ultimately, ultimately, if we have any faith, any belief in God, that is one thing that does unite us. We may approach God differently. We may approach God from a whole different perspective or a different ritual or a different service, a different way of, uh, of worshiping God. But if that's what we're ultimately doing, then we will find our togetherness in that.